On the last episode, I showed you how to set up the NVIDIA Jetson Nano. You can work with it directly using a keyboard, monitor, and mouse, or you can go headless by using SSH or remote desktop. This time, I'd like to show you a few demos, as well as how to use transfer learning to train a neural network to recognize new objects. Last time, we installed the Jetson Inference Repository from NVIDIA, which comes with a few demos that we're going to try out. Additionally, we set up the system to use Python 3 as default. Please go through these steps if you have not done so already. Probably the easiest demo to run is DetectNet on some images. So I grabbed a few pictures of dogs off the internet and copied them over to the Downloads folder on my Jetson Nano. Let's open an SSH terminal to the Jetson and navigate to the Jetson Inference directory. In there, go to build ARC64 bin. These are the tools that got built in the last episode. For example, the DetectNet camera and DetectNet console. These allow us to use pre-built neural networks to detect certain objects and images. So let's call DetectNet console, give it the pug picture, and output a new image. The final parameter is the trained network we want to use. In this case, we'll use the Coco network optimized to look for dogs. When you run it for the first time, you might notice that the CUDA engine needs to build, and this could take a few minutes. Subsequent runs after that should go much more quickly. When it's done, go to the Downloads folder. You might need to refresh the folder if you're browsing using the SSH file system. When we open the output image, we see that our pug has been highlighted, and the model indicated that it thinks it's a dog with a 98.7% certainty. Alright, let's try again with two dogs doing something active. Well, that's not quite right. I mean, the dog on the right does kind of look like a teddy bear, but as you can see, neural networks aren't always the most accurate, even professionally trained ones. Now, let's run it on that painting of dogs. Okay, it found two of the most obvious dogs, but it didn't see the rest. It also thinks one of them is a person. You might have read some things that say we've approached human-level abilities of object recognition with machine learning, and I beg to differ a little. The fact that a computer can quickly classify these objects in an image is very impressive, but I don't think we're at human level yet. For the next demo, you'll need a webcam or CSI camera plugged into your Jetson Nano. My Logitech C920 works well here, and version 2 of the Raspberry Pi camera is supposed to work as well. Because we're doing a live demo with a webcam, I recommend doing this from a monitor attached to the Jetson Nano. Streaming video doesn't seem to work very well with remote desktop. Bring up a terminal and call the DetectNet camera program. Note that you can call the .py one if you want to run it in Python. This can be useful if you'd like to dig through NVIDIA's source code. Give it the Coco Dog network again and set the camera to the dash dev dash video zero device file. This device file is used for USB webcams. If you're using a camera plugged into the CSI port, like the Raspberry Pi camera, you'll want to set camera to just zero or one, whichever one works. You can see that the program will attempt to put a bounding box around my dog and classify it as a dog. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well at a decent frame rate. These are fun demos, but let's try training a model ourselves. We'll still be using the tools that come in the NVIDIA Inference Repository, but it's a good way to see how training works. Normally, to train a neural network, we start with some architecture for a network. For example, this network has four layers, which isn't too bad. Professional networks that have been trained to accurately identify images can have more than a dozen layers with hundreds of nodes. We then randomize the weights and then begin to feed it whatever we want it to classify. For these deep neural networks, this might be thousands or millions of photos of one type of object, like a cat. The first thing it does is try to guess if the image is a cat or not. Because we've told it that the image is a cat, it can calculate a cost or loss. Basically, how far off was it from guessing the right answer? This is known as supervised learning, as we're providing the right answers during the training step. We're telling the algorithm that these are pictures of cats. The training algorithm then uses this loss value to update the weights in the network. We then do the same thing again with a new image, over and over again. We keep doing this until that loss value is as low as possible. At this point, we should have a well-trained model. We can then feed it a picture of a cat that it's never seen, and it should be able to identify it as such, assuming we did a good job of designing the network architecture and training the model. Training some of these deep neural networks can take days on even the largest, most powerful clusters of CPUs and GPUs. However, there is a technique called transfer learning, where we can tweak an existing network to do what we want. Let's start with that network we just trained on cats. To do transfer learning, we then train this network on something slightly different, like dogs this time. 
This will cause the weights to update slightly as the network now learns to classify this new object. Once the training is done, we can have the network attempt to classify new images of dogs it has not seen before. If we want a network to tell the difference between a cat and a dog, we add an extra node to the output layer. With a little bit of extra math, we can essentially determine the probability that the neural network thinks the image is a dog versus the probability that it thinks it's a cat. Normally, we would just pick the higher probability to be our final answer. Instead of cats and dogs, we're going to do a couple of simple utensils. We'll see if we can use transfer learning to train a pre-made neural network to identify the difference between a fork and a spoon. I'll let you add knife if you really want to. We'll be using the ResNet 18 neural network. This is an 18 layer deep residual network that's been pre-trained on more than a million images and able to classify a thousand object categories. It might be able to recognize fork and spoon right out of the box, but that takes away some of the fun of training your own network. Feel free to try training it on very different objects, like hand signals. We're going to need more RAM for this, so let's create a swap file on our SD card. Call fallocate to create a 4GB file on our disk under the mount directory. Next, we change permissions so that only root can read and write to the swap file. Then we use make swap to set the file up as the swap area. Finally, we call swap on with the file to start using it. If you don't want to call swap on each time you log in, you can modify the fstab file and add it as a swap space entry. You can then check to make sure it's working with swap on s. We'll need to do this next part from the Jetson Nano itself as we'll be working with a live feed from the camera. Open a terminal and create a directory named datasets in your home directory. Go into datasets and create another directory named utensils. Go into that and create a text document named labels.txt. Add our three categories. Notice that I have added background here. It's useful to give the network some kind of default category if there's no utensil in the frame. Take a look at your labels document. For this to work, you will need to have the labels in alphabetical order on separate lines in the text document. Finally, start the camera capture tool, which should have been installed when we did the make install step in the previous episode. Once again, I'm using dash dev dash video zero for my USB webcam here. Set this parameter to zero or one if you're using a CSI camera. I'll also reduce the resolution to 640 by 480. It's usually a good idea to use the smallest image size you can as it'll save you many computational steps for training and later classification, giving you a faster frame rate. In the tool, set the dataset path to the utensils folder. Change the class labels to the labels text file that we just created. Notice that it automatically reads the classes from the text file. First up is the training set for the background category. Take at least 30 photos using the button or spacebar of whatever your background is. Because we're doing this with such a small training set and we're doing transfer learning instead of fully training a network, you'll want to keep the background mostly the same with nearly the same lighting. Once you're done, switch over to the validation set and take another 10 photos. Finally, switch to the test set and take yet another 10 photos. Then switch to the fork category and take 30 photos for the training set, 10 for the validation set and another 10 for the test set. You can move the fork around a little, but try to keep it in about the same spot in each photo. Otherwise, the model will not be very accurate. When you're done with that, switch to the spoon category and repeat the whole process. When you're done, close out of the capture tool. Navigate to the Jetson inference directory and go into Python training classification. There, NVIDIA has provided us with a Python program that will train the ResNet 18 model with our new photos. Run train.py and tell it to output the model to a new directory called utensils and point it to the datasets utensils directory we made earlier. Let that run for a while. Note that it might take 20 or 30 minutes. While that's training, let's talk about why you need different training, validation, and test sets. First, a couple of definitions. A model parameter is a variable or value that makes up part of the model itself. These are values that are updated automatically whenever we run the training algorithm. They are estimated and tweaked based on the input data we provide. A hyperparameter, on the other hand, is a different configuration value that exists outside of the model. For example, the learning rate or batch size of images we use to train the model are considered hyperparameters. Often, hyperparameters are set manually, but there are some techniques we can employ to set them automatically. This is where a cross-validation set comes in. Whenever we get a set of new data to train a model with, we often divide it up into three sets, training, cross-validation, and test. It's generally important to randomly place our data into these groups. 
We didn't do that for our demo, and that's because it's just a quick demo. You'll normally see about 60% of the data be used for model training, 20% for cross-validation, and 20% set aside for testing. Here's how we can use the cross-validation set to help us select hyperparameters. Let's say we want to figure out the best learning rate to use, which is just a number that tells the algorithm how much to change the parameters, weights in this case, on each training step. We can start with a basic set of learning rates, such as 0 0.01, 0 0.1, and 1. First, we train our neural network model using the first learning rate of 0 0.01. Then, we use the model to try and classify things in our validation set. Since we already know the answers in that set, we can calculate what percentage of classifications the model gets right, giving us an accuracy score. Let's say that one gives us 76%. Okay, let's try this again, but use a learning rate of 0.1 instead. This will likely give us a slightly different model than before. So we test it against the same cross-validation set and find that the accuracy is now 83%. Let's repeat that process one more time for a learning rate of 1. This time, we find that the accuracy is much worse. With several accuracies to choose from, we can pick the highest and retrain the model one last time using that learning rate. We can do this for a variety of different hyperparameters, but it's computationally expensive to retrain models over and over like this, which is why picking hyperparameters usually requires a small amount of human intervention. Only once we have a fully trained model with tuned hyperparameters do we then use the test set. We can then get a final accuracy result based on how well the model classifies objects it's never seen before. You should never use the test set for either training or choosing hyperparameters, or you risk overfitting the model, which means it won't be good at working with unseen data. Most data scientists recommend setting aside 20% of your raw data at the very beginning and not touching it until you get to the end when you're ready to evaluate your model. Let's go back to our Jetson as our model should be fully trained. Note that the program takes care of adjusting some of the necessary hyperparameters for us so we don't have to worry about it. We first need to run the ONNX export program and point it to our utensils directory. ONNX is the Open Neural Network Exchange format and it allows us to store our model in a single file. From there we call the ImageNet camera tool. You'll want to give it the ONNX model we just created and point it to the labeled text file. Once again, I'm using a USB camera and setting it to a resolution of 640x480. I'm not super sure what the blob parameters do, but they seem to be necessary for running it with a camera. Once everything initializes, you should see a stream from your camera. Position it just like you did for taking the training images and hold up your fork and spoon to it. It should be able to mostly identify background versus fork versus spoon. Note that it's not always super accurate, as we had such a small training set and we were doing transfer learning instead of creating a neural network from scratch. But it is really cool we can train models on our Jetson Nano. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this, and happy hacking!